And the thing that woke me up as a mom is when the World Health Organization came out and classified Roundup as a probable carcinogen to humans. So I'm like, wait a minute. This, so to translate, this probably causes cancer in humans. And 95% of the crops grown in, grown in the U.S. are genetically modified. Hello, and welcome to the Art of Living Well podcast. I'm Stephanie May Potter, and I'm here with my co-host, Marnie Dotches marmette We created the Art of Living Well podcast to empower you to live your happiest, healthiest, and most authentic life. Each week, we will bring you inspiring and motivating conversations covering health and wellness topics, including fitness, mindset, food, travel, product reviews, and strategies from a variety of experts, including our own bank of knowledge. We are excited to educate, motivate, and inspire you to change the way you perceive health and discover your art of living well. Get ready to feel inspired. Hello and welcome back to the Art of Living Well podcast. So guys, who's ready to kick off 2023 with the support and accountability that you're craving to take your health to the next level? It's almost time for our next Functional Medicine Liver Detox. And just like last year, we are doing a full 14 days starting on Sunday, January 8th. We're doing this because we've heard from many of you that while you love the seven days, sometimes, especially this time of year, We need a little bit more time to keep up with the good habits and healthy eating after the holiday season. And this second week really allows you to help transition back to a sustainable eating routine with our support and accountability, as well as the groups. And we have some exciting additions this year. We're going to be doing having an energy clearing session with the amazing Lizzie Cutler, who was guest on our podcast in episode 104. And we don't want you to just take our word for it. Here's what one of our detox alumni had to say. She said, after completing the 14-day detox, I feel amazing, I have more energy, and I am in a great mood. I loved the daily emails, videos, recipes, and eating ideas. I've done the seven-day detox several times, but I really enjoyed the 14-day program because it helped make my habits more sustainable. So give yourself the gift of health this holiday season. Click the link in our show notes, message us with questions, or head on over to our website for more information and sign up today. And now we are very excited to share today's guest, Sarah Fisher, who is a regenerative farmer just outside of the Twin Cities in Minnesota. Sarah and her family own and operate Nature's Pantry Farm, where they supply 250 plus families with farm fresh food, including 100% grass-fed beef pastured pork and chicken, pasture free range eggs and raw milk. This is such an important and powerful conversation where we dive in and talk about the connection between true nutrition and health and how eating the right foods can actually heal chronic disease as well as prevent many others from occurring. Sarah shares many stories from her customers who are now able to eat eggs and dairy again without unwanted symptoms and food sensitivities. It really makes us question and ask the question, what in the world have we done to food that is causing people to become so sick and intolerant of foods like dairy and eggs? So in today's episode, you're going to learn about conventional farming practices, how they're contributing to people being so sick, and really how improving the health of our soil and the animals can help heal our bodies. We talk a little bit about regenerative farming practices, the differences with conventional farming. You'll learn what the terms raw and ultra pasteurized mean when it comes to the milk that you're drinking. We talk about genetically modified crops. We even dive into the topic of fake meat and so much more. Sarah shares her simple tips to eat the right whole nourishing foods so that you can actually heal chronic disease as well as prevent many others from occurring. So with that, let's d- dive right in to this powerful conversation with Sarah Fisher from Nature's Pantry Farm. But first, a quick word from our sponsor, Shield Your Body. Shield Your Body is a company that makes products to shield your body against electromagnetic frequency, or EMF radiation, from modern technology. Did you know that all modern technology is a source of EMF radiation? Cell phones, laptops, Wi-Fi, even your refrigerator is a source of EMF radiation. And each year, we are exposed to more and more EMFs. 
There are literally thousands of high quality peer reviewed scientific studies demonstrating clear links between exposure to EMF radiation and a wide range of negative health effects from anxiety and infertility to sleep disruption and cancer. Fortunately, there are easy ways that you can reduce your EMF exposure right now that cost you absolutely nothing. After reading the Shield Your Body Guide, I stopped using my AirPods, something I used daily for hours sometimes and have switched back to the old school wired headphones. And for me, after reading the Shield Your Body Guide, I really put my foot down and insisted that my kids keep their cell phones and their laptops out of their bedrooms at night while they were sleeping. And I've been working on Jordan as well. And I think after reading the guide and listening to our podcast, he has finally agreed to do that. So download your copy of a free guide at shieldyourbody.com to start improving your health right now. And be sure to check out our episode number 123 with R. Blank, CEO of Shield Your Body. Hi, Sarah. Marnie and I are really excited to have you as a guest on our show today to share your immense knowledge about the connection between food and how it's raised and our overall health. And we were fortunate enough to be introduced, I think, over a year ago from one of our friends, Naomi, who Marnie and I know from Modern Well in the Twin Cities. And I was interested in trying your meat and eggs and your raw milk and yogurt for my family. And I'm just so excited to be able to share um, everything that you're going to talk about today on our show. I love having this a local farmer that really cares about the the treatment of the animals and the quality of the products that you're that you're raising. Um, So everyone has a story and we would love for you to share your journey in a nutshell of you know, how you became an RN and a farmer, and ultimately you revamped your farming practices to create a regenerative farm and your commitment to raising fresh, wholesome, and pasture-raised food for your family and our community. Yeah, well, I'm so excited to be here, and I just think this is such an important topic. Um, People are really starting to realize that the foods that they eat actually matter, and it can impact their health. So our journey started, well, first of all, I grew up on a what we call a regular dairy farm. So we did, we farmed like every other family did around us. Um, All the chemicals, all the things, you know, never questioned anything. This is just how you farmed. And then we knew I have a brother and a sister and myself, and we knew that nobody wanted to come and take over the farm because we saw like how, how difficult it was for my parents um, just to, just to, um, run a farm and things like that. So we all went on and did our own thing. I went to school and became a registered nurse. um, And my brother and sister did their own thing as well. Um, And then my dad made the decision after he injured his knee, he couldn't take care of the dairy any longer. So he decided that the cows had to go. So this farm has been in our family for my kids are the sixth generation. So it was a really hard, um, a really hard time for them to make the decision to end the farm. And that basically was going to be the end of our family's legacy. So he sold the cows and he finally had a little extra free time. And he, you just look around and he asked one question. And that question is why, have it, why is everyone so sick? You know, cancers everywhere, diabetes, heart disease. Um, people are getting sicker at younger and younger ages. And he was like, something is going on. So he started researching um, how the foods that we eat affect our health. And ultimately that comes down to our farming practices. So the chemicals that are being put on foods, I don't think people realize it's herbicides, it's pesticides, it's fungicides, it's insecticides, it's anything you can think of and we're eating it and people don't realize it. So at this time, I was just finishing nursing school and we, we were, Tom and I were recently married and then we were having our first child and I was starting to like take in this information and I was mortified as a young mom. Like I can't feed my kids GMOs and um, you know, all these chemicals in their food. I just can't do it. So we packed up our life in town and moved to the farm and set out just to raise food for ourselves, like the way we wanted it to be done. So I, I was having a hard time reading labels and, you know, not really trusting that I was getting what I thought I was paying for in the grocery store. Uh, so I thought, well, who can do it better than myself? So we moved out here 
just to feed ourselves. And we now support over 250 families. Um, 100% of our products go from our farm straight to your family. There is no middleman here. It is me to you. And it's just been such an amazing journey. I have met so many amazing people through this. Moms that their kids are healing. I just had a mom email me today. Her son had a anaphylactic reaction after eating eggs. Hasn't they haven't eaten eggs for four years? He just had his first egg from our farm in the doctor's office to make sure it was going to be okay. And he tolerated it just fine. It's just like, those are the things like this really does matter. And this work is so important and it's affecting lives like in ways I would have never imagined. That's, that's so incredible. And I can't believe you like packed up your life, moved to a farm and started raising your own food. Like if I said that to my husband, he would look at me like I was crazy. So that is quite impressive. <laughs> um, now, granted, yeah. you grew up on a farm, so you had some basis of farming, I'm assuming. But just kind of yes. digging into what you're talking about, you know, I think we have had a guest on in the past that's talked about like regenerative, regenerative farming practices. But, you know, I think a lot of people are still not very familiar with that term or understand it. And I'm wondering if we can, you know, start the conversation with just a little bit of a background on what some of those differences are between like conventional farming practices, which is what I'm assuming you grew up with before your dad started the research and then how you've changed over time. And I, can you talk about that? Yeah. So I will be completely honest, uh, full disclaimer. The only reason um, I started to raise my own food is because I knew it was the best thing for my daughter and for our family. What I didn't know and what I have come to learn is all that goes on um, like in the soil and soil health and what it means to be a regenerative farmer. So yes, we were conventional farmers um, I won't get into like the nerdy things, but like tillage and things like that, conventional farmers are doing, it's destroying all of those little microbes and bacteria and fungi and all the things that are in the soil that actually are needed to make healthy food or to make healthy plants. And then your animals eat those healthy plants and then you eat those healthy animals. So there's a lot of research going on right now, and I'm certainly not the expert to talk about it. Um, but creating that symbiosis in our soil and how that ultimately affects the final product of our food. So for example, now we don't do things like, number one, we're transitioning. We have 300 acres between my husband and my parents, um, about 50% of that. So 150 acres roughly is into pasture. So that is, um, you know, it's not sprayed, it's not tilled, it's just left um, and it nature, mother nature will heal herself. If you leave her undisturbed, mm -hmm. I mean, there's, you know, there's, um, things that we do and I won't really get into that, but like with our cattle and things like that, um, how we move them through and how much we let them eat. And then they're dropping their manure and they're, um, you know, stimulating the soil and just bringing breath or life back into our soil, essentially, um, to create that, that final healthy product. So um, the whole idea with regenerative farming is you, um, from when you start, you leave something better than when you started. So each year our pastures come back. We've been doing this almost a decade now. And each year, you know, provided we have rain and like the necessary circumstances happen, um, we have just beautiful pastures, like essentially it's free feed for our animals. Um, we're not spending money on seed. We're not spending money on chemicals. You know, we're not doing all those things that conventional farmers have to do. So it's truly a win-win for the consumer the farmer, uh, the land and everything. It's just, it's, it's the solution to the food crisis as we know it. Right. And even climate change. I know there is that, is it kiss the ground? Yes. The documentary. Wow, which yep. is fast, fascinating. Mm -hmm. It's like with some, it's like just going back yes. to basic, going back to way 
animals were raised, going back to way nature intended it. And to your point, why is everyone getting sick? I mean, and so I, Mm -hmm. yes, I I love this topic. Um, So can you talk a little bit getting into that? Like, what are the health benefits of using the farming practices that you guys are currently using more regenerative and, Mm -hmm. you know, the the conventional way? So you talked a little bit about like pesticides and herbicides Mm -hmm. and things like that. Mm -hmm. Yep. So that stuff isn't used on our farm Um, for our, for our grass fed beef. We're not organic. We are trying to figure out how we can transition our corn to organic. It's not an overnight switch. We've just, we've damaged our soil for 75, 80 years, tillage, chemicals, and all those things. So if we would go full on organic with our corn right now, it would be an epic failure. So we are working on it, um, but like our grass-fed beef, it is um, no chemicals that are put on that. Um, so the health benefits of grass-fed beef, um, you've got a higher level of the omega-3 fatty acids. Uh, you've got higher levels of conjugated linoleic acid, which are found in all of your pasture-raised products. So like, for example, with the raw milk, when you, make, you take the cream and you make butter, it's that bright yellow that's conjugated linoleic acid, which is giving it that color, which has huge cancer fighting benefits. Um, we're not using antibiotics and hormones in our food. I was chatting with one of my friends, obviously we live in, we live in a farming community and her dad used to raise steers. And she said, well, do you guys put like the ear implants in the, the ears of your animals? So they grow faster. I was like, what? She's like, well, yeah, it's a hormone that all these farmers are doing so you can finish a steer in 14 or 15 months instead of 18 to 24 months. And I was just, those are the things that people don't realize are happening to their food. It's can I the ask bottom you a line is always that? dollar. I have a question yeah. about that. So I can't remember if it was another podcast, but somewhere along the way, we had learned that there was a law that there really couldn't be any hormones or antibiotics in your meat and poultry. And that when people, when companies put that on their packaging, that was more of like a marketing thing when in fact, none of the products have that. So can you clarify that for me? Cause I'm sure I'm missing so I, something. Um, I don't know that. I don't know the specific law, but I know, for example, just having grown up on a dairy farm, like you can't, sell your milk within X number of days of treating a cow with antibiotics. So does that make sense? So like so many days before you sell it, it can't be, you can't, she can't have antibiotics. So that's not saying you couldn't have treated her, you know, three months ago with antibiotics and she's been off of it now for two and a half months, but you can use those products in your cattle. I don't know if you have to get rid of it a certain time before slaughter but I know that's a a common practice. I think that's actually for for poultry. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We don't use any of that. So I don't have a lot of knowledge about it, but I just, it's just that like, it's that deceiving um, people don't know. And if you don't know, you're never going to question, Oh, I wonder if this steak I'm eating had extra hormones to make it grow faster or, you know, like it's just, Mm -hmm. um, there's just no, transparency, I think, in the current food system right now. Um, So back to the health benefits. Our cows, I'm not saying we've never, ever used antibiotics. You know, we had an example this spring that we we had a a milk cow have milk fever. She would have died without three days of penicillin. So she got three days of penicillin. Obviously, her milk was dumped and those sorts of things, but it's not a routine every day. I won't let an animal die because of my pride. but there are these farms that the animals are so crowded um, and literally living in their own filth that it's just breeding grounds for disease. And without antibiotics, they die. And again, like I said, it always comes down to profit. So farmers need to keep their animals alive to sell them to pay their bills. So it's just this vicious cycle. Um, conventional farming, I think it's it's just the model is so wrong. It's just so disrespectful to the animals and you know the the natural instincts that they have like our pigs are so happy when it rains or just they just roll in the mud and run in the dirt that's what pigs are designed to do 
chickens are designed to run around and chase bugs and scratch the dirt and, you know, find worms and those sorts of things. That's how God made them, not crammed in a barn where they can't even turn around or stretch their wings. It's just, um, it's, it's just sad what conventional farming has done. So how, how does conventional farming view a farm like you? Do you butt heads? Do they want to learn? Like, I'm just curious, like how, how that's received. Well, I will tell you, we are the only one in our area that I know of for about a almost 60 mile radius of um, that's doing this type of work. Um, we have, Obviously, I, I think we're the talk of the town and talk of the neighborhood, and, and that's okay. Like, I really, I really don't care what anybody thinks about me. In my mind and in my heart, I am doing what I am being called to do. I am being obedient to being a servant of the knowledge that I have been given, and this is how I am making a difference. And I would do anything to help any other farmer start this. So our farmers have like the highest suicide rate out of any profession there is mm -hmm. because let me tell you it is not easy to farm conventionally your input costs and what it takes and all the equipment um you can't even cash flow it you can't afford it to feed your family so you have to have an in-town job and you have to do all these things and you know you're dependent on the markets and you can't even you can't even you know make your paycheck in a year guaranteed so it's um, regenerative farming is so the other way you are in total control of, of, you know, what you're doing. Um, you can set your prices, whatever you need to actually pay yourself a wage. Um, you're not dependent on the markets and those sorts of things. So, um, I think there's changes hard. So farmers have been farming like this while well, my great, great grandpa farmed this way. And this is, this is just how we farm and not everybody's open to learning new things. And the other thing I think that was really hard for my dad. So he's 65 ish, I think something like that 67 right now. And to relearn and unlearn everything he's known his entire life. Midlife. I was like, you had a midlife crisis, sir. There, there's <laughs> just no way that's what happened, but he could have just slid into retirement, not done any of this. This type of work is hard. It's every single day we are out there for hours doing chores every single day, you know, moving our animals, battling milk, setting up fence, whatever it might be. But I think when you know better, you do better. And farmers are afraid of like failure and change. Um, and also being, being the oddball out, I guess. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, no, that makes sense. It, it makes me wonder, I'm just thinking out loud right now, you know, as you're talking about like hormones and antibiotics, what about giving like the cattle or whatever um, supplements like that we, you know, like if I take vitamin D and I take vitamin C and vitamin B and whatever, how does that, do you do that kind of thing for your animals? And I love that question. So we have, um, it's called free choice mineral. And um, this is part of like the research my dad has done and stuff. So basically, um, the, our cows are the only ones who get this. But a cow is so intelligent that she knows what her body is deficient in. Whereas you and I, like we're literally just guessing. I'm going to take some vitamin D and I'm going to pop some vitamin C, right? Like we're just guessing. But a cow actually knows what she's deficient in. So what we have is it's this box. It has got 18 different minerals in it. Um, I can't name them all for you, but you know, 18 minerals. And so she will flip, there's this rubber cover on the top and she'll flip it up and she'll nose through there and eat the minerals that her body is deficient in. So oh, yes. our cows, it's amazing. <laughs> so our cows are deficient. What they're eating the most of is potassium. So that tells us if our cows are deficient in potassium, they're not getting it from our soil, which means our soils are deficient in it. So when she goes in and eats that potassium, it's helping her. And then she's leaving her manure on our pastures, which has potassium in it, which goes onto our soil. And just, it's this whole healing process for our, our land, basically. So it's amazing. 
That wow. is so cool. That is I, I so I, cool. Yes. And yeah, like, I, just the fact that they know what they need. And I think that's just kind of goes back to like, even as humans, like maybe we don't know that we need vitamin C, but if we really just kind of get out in tune nature in. and tune in and are not distracted, we, we know what our bodies need. Oh, I probably need to drink more water right. or I probably need yeah. to eat more vegetables, whatever it is. Right. Yeah. Um, that, that is fascinating. That is so cool. And um, it's and amazing. Do, is this something that conventional farmers do as well? Or are they just like, okay, every cow or every whatever cattle, however you say it, needs a, you know, a stab of vitamin C and a stab of vitamin D mm-hmm. and whatever. Everybody's the same kind of thing. So or I don't, you don't I, know. Um, I would bet pretty good money that that's not happening on farms. What they do is they work with um, like dietitians. So they're creating feed rations for their cattle. So, you know, they're like experts in nutrition. So I'm, I'm thinking if they find that their cows are suffering from this, 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 well, they're more than likely deficient in this, this, this. So then they put that in their feed ration or something. So for us, we don't, we don't mix feed for our cattle. It's literally fresh grass out in the pasture. And then in the winter time, like now my husband is home, just got home and he's working on um, baling hay. So it's, there's no feed for these cattle except for grass. And then the minerals that they choose to eat. So, and can you talk a little bit about the the health benefits and what you've seen? Because I know you're doing a lot of this research and general reading on this subject that you're so passionate about. How some of these conventional farming practices are specifically contributing to illnesses and people being sick and a lot sicker than they were um, Mm -hmm. decades ago. Sure. So I think, um, well, one of the, one of the biggest things is, um, like I said, all the insecticides, fungicides, neonicticides, pesticides, all the things. Like, do we actually really know that what that's doing to human health? I mean, have do we really know? Like, cancer rates, what did I read? By like 20, 30, it's 50% of people are projected to have cancer. Don't quote me on that. But it's, that should be concerning to people, Right. <laughs> So yeah. there's that. And then the thing that woke me up as a mom is when the World Health Organization came out and classified Roundup as a probable carcinogen to humans. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, wait a minute. This, so to translate, this probably causes cancer in humans. And 95% of the crops grown in, grown in the U.S. are genetically modified. And, and can you clarify that for our listeners that kind of know what a GMO is, but may not you know, equate Roundup and if they see Monsanto, I mean, not to like (laughs) talk about this. Go for for it, Stephanie. (laughs) Well, you read about it in the paper sometimes, you know? Totally. Yeah. You do. Yeah, you do read about it. So uh, what they've done with it's, um, I think it's, well, for sure, corn, beans, and isn't it, um, there's not, is it, um, there's another one that they've modified, I do believe. So I, Um, I don't even know. So yeah, I don't know what they're all working on. Who knows? Um, So they've, somehow gotten into the genetics of these plants and modified them. So they are what's called Roundup resistant. So they basically what Roundup will do is it will literally kill everything. I believe it's a broadleaf herbicide. I could be wrong on that, but my husband would know. And my dad, obviously. Um, So it'll kill everything, every plant basically. So what they've done when they've modified it is these plants are now resistant to Roundup. So you can spray an entire field um, with Roundup and it will kill everything except your plant. So when you drive through the countryside and you see these beautiful fields, like straight rows, no weeds, no nothing, um, that's the look that farmers are going for. It's totally against um, mother nature and what she's trying to do to our soil. Um, But that's the thought. It's just, it makes it easier for farmers um, for weed control, basically. yeah, so that's basically what it does for us. Okay. And I will thank, tell you, you, my dad shared with me, um, so he's been a farmer for, I don't know, 50 years, or something like that. And he said, I remember when Roundup came out in the, I think it was the late 80s, he told me. They told us it would stay in the soil about six months or so. That's what they were told. We are finding Roundup, like it's, it doesn't go away. It's in our mm-hmm. water, it's in our air. Like 30 years they're finding, it's like, it's still here. So again, we don't know 
And who's doing the research on this stuff? So there's um, talked about the chemicals and then like the G- GMOs and food. What about the hormones? You know, like how many young girls are getting their periods at eight, nine years old? Okay. Is it connected? I don't know. Is it not? I don't know. Um, how much infertility is going on? You know, and if you just stop and think about these things, like what's, what's 50 years going to look like? I mean, truly for humanity, how sick are people going to be? Are we going to be able to reproduce? I mean, that's a basic, that's a basic question. Like those are the places that my, my mind goes. Um, <laughs> so yeah, that's a loaded question. No, <laughs> I know, I well, know. And it actually makes me, and I don't know if you can answer this, but just taking that a step further, do you think a person can go into a grocery store or a co-op and buy food that is, you know, as safe as yours or close to safe as yours in terms of if it's, you know, grass fed beef or eggs that are farmed a certain way, or, you know, I know you can't buy raw milk in the grocery store, but can you talk about that a little bit? Most states are lucky. Yeah. So do I think food is as safe as from our farm? Um, I'm very biased and I'm going to have to say no. Um, Only because, well, there's a couple of reasons. Um, Companies have gotten really good at marketing. um, So they can put this really beautiful green pasture on your milk jug or whatever, your your steak. And um, there's really no... um, criteria. I I know for like the grass fed label, they just have to have access to a little bit of grass. There's a difference. Let me tell you when your cows are eating stubble, you know, about an inch or two inches versus, you know, belly deep and fresh pasture, like the marbling and the flavor that you're going to get in your meat. Um, So again, there's um, just the guidelines around that. Number one, I think are just too loosey goosey at this point right now. Um, and for example, I just had a, a friend email me, I bought all this organic hamburger from Aldi's. I was like, it was such a great deal. I'm like, okay, well, if it's organic, that's, that's better than nothing. But I said, Brit, it's just 100% organic corn fed beef. She's like, what? Oh, but I thought I was getting like pasture raised because it's organic. I'm like, I'm no, it's, I promise you, it's just grain fed organic beef. It's not what you think it is, but they probably had some green packaging on the label. So she's thinking it's, it's better. Um, so there's just, it gets tricky that way. I do think it's getting easier for people to make better choices in the grocery store. I think companies are starting to pick up on people like us who are choosing to um, purchase healthier foods for our family and want to know where it's coming from and those sorts of things. So I think it's getting easier, but your best bet is always going to be going to directly to your farmer. We offer farm tours. I want people here. I want you to see my cows on a pasture. I want you to see the cows where your milk is coming from. I want you to pick your own eggs. Like Mm -hmm. it is just, then you know exactly what you're getting and there's no questions. So like we have nothing to hide. Come come for a tour and just like people leave here and they're just like, I cannot believe that you do this. Like, this is so amazing. This is such a gift that we can give this to our family now. And it's, it's just, it's wonderful. I would love to yeah. come for a tour. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yes. I, I know every last summer. year you had them. Yes. And I wasn't able to come, but it's on my list. Cause mm-hmm. and I, I think my kids would love it. We've been yeah. so sourcing from you and previously other local, like, of a few local farmers. And so they get it. We talk about it because you can see the color of the eggs and the double yolks that come sometimes that you don't yeah. see when you're um, buying most you know, products at the store. And I will say we are lucky in Minnesota right. to have some really good co-ops and they do source from several mm-hmm. local farmers also. But mm-hmm. I think when we're speaking broadly, when you're just shopping at your average grocery store, no, you're not able to get you know, high quality. The one product. other thing, I forgot to mention, um, so tricky with the, with the labeling thing. Um, so chickens, when you see cage free chickens, in my opinion, that's almost even more humane than cage chickens because they literally are just crammed in the barn then. 
And at least when they have a cage, they can not get pecked on by the other chickens because I mean, even our chickens will peck at each other and they have like 10 acres to run around. Um, so cage free, it sounds really fantastic, but there's still probably 4,000 birds or whatever crammed into a barn. It's not any different than just yeah. regular eggs, I guess you could say. So what would you look for? Like, yeah. what would be the right terminology? In the grocery store? Yeah. Like, what if you, that was your only choice? <laughs> Pasture raised. <laughs> I don't, I don't shop at the grocery store for any of this, so I don't look at labels. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would get pasture raised. You do not want vegetarian feed. They're, chickens are not vegetarians. I just was watching a chicken devour a frog oh. yesterday. Like, I know it's like a little gruesome, but they love meat. Chickens, they need it just, just like you and I do. So um, they're omnivores. So don't, you don't want vegetarian feed. Like they try to sell that. Like it's a cool thing. No. Um, so for eggs. Huh. Yeah. And what about yeah. organic? At least they're eating, if they're, when they're eating feed, they're eating organic food. Cause then you know there's Correct. no GMOs yes. and yeah. Correct. Okay. I would look for the organic label. Yes. Okay. Well, that's so super helpful. Cause it is. I mean, I think <laughs> eggs, and di- eggs, dairy and meat are super confusing when you go to the grocery store. Yeah, I agree. And chicken too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think chicken is also. My problem with the, when you buy the grass fed dairy in the grocery store, Mm -hmm. like I think that's wonderful like here's like grass-fed whole milk how perfect except you look at the label and it's ultra pasteurized so I was I was like why would they do that because I just don't understand why does this have to be ultra pasteurized but regular milk can just be pasteurized and so the reason is I did a little research on it is because it's produced you know in such smaller quantities than regular milk so it can have a shelf life of Mm -hmm. what did I read? It was like five weeks or something. Don't quote me on that again either, but you literally don't even have to refrigerate that stuff. It is sterile. There is nothing good in there for you. And it it just breaks my heart. Again, people think they're getting this amazing grass-fed product. It's not serving you. Oh, it's not serving you at all. Hey guys, Stephanie and I are loving this new product from Keon that we have been trying probably for like the last, I don't know, four to six weeks now. It's Keon Pure Plant-Based Amino Acids. It's a premium blend of essential amino acids in a convenient, delicious drink mix. I really like the cool lime and the mixed berry. Um, And these are fantastic for before a workout, after a workout. You feel energized, it boosts athletic recovery, it supports really lean muscle mass. Um, There's all nine essential amino acids and there's no artificial ingredients, which we both love. When I was traveling, I didn't bring them with me and I definitely noticed a difference. So I highly recommend trying. It's, like I said, it's great before and after your workout. Kion also has some other products, a couple we want to mention. They have mold-free coffee, which is fantastic for people that drink coffee. And they also have a great whey protein powder. My daughter has been using it in her smoothies on a daily basis. So we have a code. It's Art of Living. And you can get 10% off single products or 15% off bundles. Or 20% off a subscription, which is what I'm doing now because I'm using my amino acids pretty much every day. So go check out www.getkion.com and use the code Art of Living. So the milk is a big question, and I love that I've been able to buy your raw milk for the last year. And I will just say my oldest son, who was like, kind of finally accepted the fact that he was lactose intolerant, you know, just dairy sensitive to begin with, took a while. And then I bought your milk and he was finally able to drink milk again for the first time. So he was like skin rashes and some stomach issues. And so again, this just goes, gets back to what you're saying, where food is medicine. And maybe if you have a reaction to certain foods, there's another underlying reason, you know, as far as the quality mm-hmm. of the food you're, you're getting. 
but a lot like of pesticides, <laughs> right? Yes. And, and, you know, yes. and I was buying, I was buying organic before and grass fed and all the things, but this is so interesting. You're saying, and I knew the ultra pasteurized wasn't the route to go, but honestly, when you're in the store, it's very hard to find milk. That's not ultra pasteurized. That's also grass fed and organic. Correct. I don't so think it's you can. So, so frustrating. Yeah. Okay. You have, I want to pivot just a little bit here, but you have a really fun and engaged Instagram account. And I want everyone out there to know because you're out there doing all these reels and fun videos and you've got the music going <laughs> and you're showing what's going on on the farm with the animals. And you're just on this mission It's really from like treatment of animals. Like you genuinely love the animals and yes, they ultimately, you know, end up, you end up consuming them. And I'm sure yeah. there's a lot of people out there that are plant-based or vegetarian or, you know, can you share a little bit about like, your thoughts on this topic and how raising your own food has created this really meaningful connection between you and the animals and mother earth. Absolutely. So that is the hardest part um, about life on a farm. It truly is. It's, it's doesn't get easier with time. Um, but now, now that I have little kids to feed and I know through the research I've done and the healing stories I've heard from families um, or just the testimonies you read of like vegans who've gone, you know, they stopped menstruating and they lost all their hair and then they start eating meat again and they just feel phenomenal. Like, so that it's, it's hard to know that these animals give the ultimate sacrifice for us. However, I have to keep in mind, God gave us these animals to have dominion over them. And if we treat them fairly, give them a fantastic life, you know, honor them. Um, we are using them to serve and we are using them to, to help people be well and to serve our community. Um, so it, it, like I said, it doesn't get easier, but knowing the fact that what they're doing, the impact they're having, it is, it's so worth it. So our promise to every animal in, on our farm is you will have a great life that we promise you. Um, and you'll just have one bad day. You know, it, it, it happens to every one of us. That's it's, it's, just a part of life. It's the circle of life. Um, but again, just providing that respect to them. And honestly, when we're eating steak, like there's no meat that is left on the table any longer. You know, it is all consumed. Um, the bones go back to make bone broth or treats for our guard dogs or whatever it might be. So there's just so much more of a connection to the food that we're eating. Um, it's meaningful. It has a story. I, know which animal is in each package that I'm eating. You can't say that from grocery store beef. They mix together thousands of animals, all these, and I'll be honest, they're like usually dairy cull cows is what they are that nobody wants to be eating that hamburger anyway, trust me. And then it's all mixed together in this big batch and then it's put on the grocery store shelves. I know what animal I'm selling right now to my, to my customers. And it's like, there's oh. just such a meaning. It, yeah, I, as hard as that is, but I know, and I know they had. That would be so hard on were. me. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would have trouble with that. But I don't eat a lot of meat, it's hard. so yeah. Um, I I can imagine that that's hard, but it's a mindset that you're used to. Yeah, and it is. It sounds like you're you're doing it in the most. I mean, it's true. There's a cycle of life, and everyone dies at some point, and. Correct. It sounds like you're giving them a wonderful life Correct. while they're alive, which is great. And our butchers are phenomenal. They literally don't know what hit them. I mean, they are on the trailer, they are off and it's done. They have no idea what's even going on. So it's not like they're, you know, at some of these processing plants, they're sitting there all day waiting for their turn to be slaughtered. Like, oh, that just breaks yeah. my heart. So no, it is a very quick, it's done and it's over. Um, no suffering, which is good. So we love being able to work with these small local butchers as well. Uh, it just makes all the difference. Yeah. And like you said, you're being of service to others. The animals are yes. being of service and you are facilitating it. And that is part of their yes. journey and their, um, uh, it's part of their life with the life cycle. Like that's why they're here. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, so one question, um, just curious on like, can we talk a little bit about fake meat for a little bit? Um, oh. Oh. <laughs> and, uh, just, I mean, I'm, I'm just kidding. Everyone has, 
are you are you talking about like the Beyond ba- Burger that kind of thing? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. You know. <laughs> yes, not, we can talk about that, of course. Yeah. Well, and just like okay. the fat and misconceptions that people have about all this stuff. Ooh. Okay. So here is my two cents, and do with it what you would like. Okay. So look at a package. Look at the label of a package of. Um, be, I don't even know what they're called. Fake meat, whatever it's called. Yeah. So look at the number of ingredients in that. Um, number one, most of this fake meat is made with soy. Um, mm-hmm. And I will tell you, soy is not our friend. Um, it just gets into it. You could probably speak more to this, Stephanie, but just um, the hormones and all of the things that it affects in our body, um, all the chemicals that are in soy, people s- seem to think that this fake meat is healthier for the planet. Oh my goodness. If you could see the amount of chemicals that are going on these soy fields, all the tillage that's being done. And it's just, it is destroying the land, which is, you know, what most conventional farming is doing. And then all of the other chemicals, I don't even know what's in the meat. I haven't even looked, but it just, if you just think simply about this, I always go back to, okay, how did people, how did the cavemen eat or your great, great, great grandma? What did she eat? Right. Because Mm -hmm. before we had access to all of these things like labs to create fake meat and all these things, how were they eating? That's how we've been designed to eat. And that's what our bodies need. Like that's the most nourishing for us. It's not fake meat. It's not fake cheese. It's not margarine, you know, like one molecule away from plastic. These fake yeah. foods are just, right. they're horrible for us. Yeah. It's just common sense. Right. Well, and, and I think the point you make about, you know, there, I know a lot of vegans specifically, and obviously different people have different reasons for being vegan, vegan and there's no judgment. I don't eat red meat, like whatever. I also don't eat fake meat, however. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but when you talk <laughs> about, you know, tofu and soy, I've never really thought about how you're saying it's not good for the planet either. Like in my mind, I'm like, okay, that's less, you know, methane or whatever in the world. But you're saying that the tillage in the soil from the soy is just as bad. And that's a really interesting point that I don't think a lot of people know. So when, okay, here's a really basic thing. This is how I think about it. Um, I don't know if you ladies garden, but let's say you, you, till your garden and you plant your rows, what grows in between those rows? Weeds. What weeds. grows there? Yeah. So what's mother nature trying to accomplish? She's covering the soil. Like soil is not made to be bare, right? So um, that's what happens in these fields. You know, like mother nature is just trying to heal. She's trying to heal herself Um, And that's where these weeds are coming in and they're covering the soil. Number one, when we go through and till and rip that up, we're releasing CO2 into the atmosphere because CO2 is stored in the soil, right? So there's that. Um, And then I could get into the whole grass fed, what we do to get CO2 back into the the soil. Um, But you're just not getting it from those soybeans or anything like that. So, yeah. So... And then you think of all the chemicals that are put on them. And then most soy is GMO, greater than 90% of the soybeans grown in the United States are GMO as well. So there's that whole like chemical thing there. I mean, you can buy non-GMO soy, which is better, um, but it's not, it's not the, um, the most common thing here. So, and it's not just soy. It's the same thing with corn that's grown here in the United States right. as well. It's, it's got the same environmental impacts and we've got water runoff. And like you wouldn't believe here, um, it's because our soils are not healthy. They don't have that network of material underneath that can actually hold water. So now we're looking at, you know, look at California. Uh, California is like a dumpster fire, like with drought and, you know, there's no water and like that I was talking to, we went and toured Gabe Brown's farm in North Dakota. I was like, so could you fix California's land out there with your farming practices? He says, absolutely. Without question. Like mm-hmm. the way we've done things has had such a trickle down effect on so many things and people just don't realize it. 
So yes. And you know, the other thing when you're talking about the environmental impact on raising animals and eating meat and chicken and is if we shopped local, if we bought from our local farmer like you, then we don't have that. Then the, the, the trucks and the emissions and all that, it reduces that significantly. So that's just another motivation for people to get out there and find your local farmer. And so, and we'll talk later about where people can find you, but just a you know, public service announcement for everyone, like go out there and Google local farmers in your area, go to local farmers markets, because a lot of times they're selling, in addition to fruits and vegetables, eggs and meat and other, and then you can connect with them and, mm-hmm. and find out how you can purchase from them all year long. COVID has truly, um, like we've never been so busy. Um, COVID with what happened with, um, remember when they were just like euthanizing barns of pigs um, because the, it was the butcher, the butchers, um, they were closing down butchering plants or whatever it was. And it's just, again, this trickle down effect and then you're seeing food shortages and now you're seeing skyrocketing meat prices. Like people mm-hmm. realize how vulnerable this system is that we've created. It's not, there is no food security in the system, the current system. I promise you food, true food security is in your local farmer. That is where it's at. Yes. Yes. There's no wow. question. Cargill Can- is not... Walmart and Cargill are not going to be there for you. Like they don't give, pardon my friends, they don't give two shits about you. I'm sorry, they don't. I agree. Yeah. I agree. And vote with I, your dollar, you know. Yes. Spend, spend your money where it's going to benefit you and your local economy and the health of your family. Yeah. Yeah. Sarah, can you share like um, one of your favorite stories about maybe a customer that's switched to eating your grass-fed pasture-raised meat or eggs or something and maybe how it's helped them heal from a disease or some unwanted symptoms? Oh my goodness. So we just had our farm to table, second annual farm to table dinner last weekend. And I was really struggling with what to say. It's like, oh, you know, I don't, I want to really talk about like photosynthesis and how I move my cows. I'm like, but nobody really cares about that stuff. So I'm like, (laughs) and then this, um, this instant, my Instagram went off and it's a mom. She's desperate to purchase raw milk for me because in her words, she said, drinking raw milk has had massive effects on my family and especially my son. This is the first time in his life. He hasn't had to deal with constipation. So I was like, Oh, well, thank you for that. I'm just going to share the stories that, Um, My favorites that families have shared with me on how it's helped them. So I went through, it's funny you asked this question. I had like five examples of um, how people have healed with our food. So um, a couple of my favorites, uh, little Maria, she's seven. Um, She gets the worst tummy ache when she eats eggs from the store. And that's devastating. If you've been egg, dairy, or soy free, like gluten free, you know how hard that is. So her mom bought eggs from us. She can tolerate them just fine. Um, Dustin wow. was told by his rheumatologist, if you can eat a diet, a very strict diet of grass-fed beef, pastured pork and chicken, I can keep you on a minimal amounts of medications for your rheumatoid arthritis. I mean, that's huge. By his rheumatologist. Wow. So I was super impressed with that. Yeah, Amanda that's... has, yeah. Amanda has weaned off of her rheumatoid arthritis medications. And because she made huge changes in her diet and she consumes everything that we have to offer. My sister, um, she had eczema on the creases of her arms for years, um, just itching, bleeding, you know, just the constant scratching, completely gone once she started drinking raw milk. Um, I, I could just, I could go on and on. I, over the years, I've had so many stories and it's just, there's no denying anymore mm-hmm. that we're not on the right path. You know, there's always that, that little in the back of your mind, wow, what if none of this actually matters? And you know, it's the, of course, but um, no, there is no denying the power of true nutrition. And then it makes me wonder what in the world have we done to food that people can't <laughs> tolerate it? Like exactly. mind blowing. What are we doing? Right. Yes. Because they're making these small switches and now they're able to eat food again. Like that right there. I don't need, I don't need a study. I don't need a hundred year study to tell me that, you know, your food is better than some conventional um, raised meat. If, 
it's having that sort of impact on people's lives Correct. and people's health. And well, and it also makes me think about like allergies specifically, like I don't eat a lot of dairy just because it does not agree with me. And it really has never agreed with me. Um, Mm -hmm. So I can't even imagine drinking raw milk in all honesty, but then I hear you talking about it and how it's helped, you know, someone with eczema and I can think of a million people with eczema and it it just makes me wonder like, Mm -hmm. you know, maybe someone like me who can't tolerate dairy Maybe it's not really that I can't tolerate dairy. It's that I can't tolerate Mm. processed dairy or like, correct. do you know what I mean? Like, absolutely. I, I have so many stories about raw milk. I haven't, my husband hasn't been able to drink milk for 10 years. Lo and behold, he has no GI upset. He felt great after drinking all raw milk. And I'll tell you why it's more than likely bothering you, Marnie. Um, some people have a true dairy allergy and you're never probably going to get away with even raw milk. Uh, But when they pasteurize that milk that you're drinking from the grocery store, um, the heat, it's destroying the enzymes and things, you know, natural vitamins and minerals that are in your milk. And one of those enzymes happens to be lactase. So lactase is how we digest milk. So you're you're, um, destroying the enzyme that is used to digest milk. With raw milk, for example, it is left totally intact. So there's lactase in the milk. So it's almost like a self-digesting product. It's just super minimal effort for your system. And that's why most people can tolerate raw milk, but not pasteurized. Like those little proteins are just altered. They're like bent and your body doesn't know what to do with it. So you get an upset tummy um, and you just think that, oh, I'm just sensitive to dairy. Um, Usually that's not the actual case. Yeah. And I mean, I trust being lactose intolerant, not knowing for many years and having eczema and all those things. And I, I can eat your yogurt just fine. Yeah. yeah. So, and mm-hmm. I never used to be able to, so mm-hmm. yeah. It's, yeah. It's pretty, and I, you it's know, pretty I think cool. there's, I don't know the whole topic. Like I have healed from leaky gut. I mean, there's just, we could just talk about so many things. Um, so there's, those sorts of things that can be going on that can be contributing to you not tolerating um, certain products or whatever it was. So that whole yeah. journey was interesting, but glad we got yes. that under control. Yes. <laughs> and I, I've read about that on your blog. So for anyone out there who wants to learn more about Sarah's mm-hmm. journey to heal her gut, um, you can check out her blog and we'll link all that up in the show notes. So can you, we love leaving our listeners with just some simple tips and you've peppered in a lot today. Um, For someone out there, maybe they're local, maybe they live, you know, in California or another state or another country, what can someone do today to start, you know, just diving into the food sources, where they're getting their food, you know, if they're interested in buying high quality meat, where they can go to really support their, Mm -hmm. their health. Mm -hmm. So um, there's a couple of things. Number one, I think that the best thing anybody can do is start reading labels. Um, that'll just really open your mind to what's actually in your food and what you're actually eating. Um, So start there. If you can't pronounce it, don't eat it. Um, If you don't know what it is, look it up, see what it is. Maybe it's some cancer causing filler that's in your creamer, for example, that people are, I um, challenge people on my Instagram to look at their creamer and they're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe all the crap that's in here. Yeah, Mm. totally. Um, So anyway, start reading labels find a, find a local farmer. There are so many farmers, especially my generation, um, who are willing to step outside of the box and do things differently, um, and produce food for the community. Regenerative Farmers of America on Instagram has an integrative map of the United States. So maybe you're not from Minnesota, but they have pins all over the country of regenerative farmers that you can buy food from. Um, so I would suggest starting there. Realmilk.com is a really good source for local raw dairy. Um, that is, you know, nationwide again, but just get out there and find a farmer, grow your own food. You are in control of your food when you're growing it. If you're not going to dump Roundup on your food, I mean, nobody's going to do that. So just start small, have a small garden, have a pot of tomatoes on your deck, get your kids involved and just start making those connections to the food that you're eating. 
ask questions to your farmer. Like we want to hear from you. We want to know what you are wondering because we're here to help you. I love that. I love um, how you break it down into such a simple way to just, you know, start talking to your farmers and very easy to do things as so you can gradually Mm -hmm. make those changes, put a, you know, grow a pot of tomatoes on your deck. How hard can that be? Right. One pot of tomatoes. (laughs) Farmers markets. I forgot. That's a big one. Those are huge. This time of year in Minnesota, go to Mm -hmm. the straight from the farm, go to a farmer's market, invest your dollars locally. You will never regret it. Um, so Sarah, this conversation has been amazing and I've learned so much and I'm sure our listeners have too. If people want more, which I'm sure they will, how (laughs) and where can they find you and connect with you? So we are in Lafayette, Minnesota at Southern Minnesota. Um, you can go on our website, which you can, I'll give you the link and you can put that below. Um, we've got some drop locations for anybody interested up in the Metro, Uh, We have a farm store on site that people can pick up from. And then we've got some other local pickup sites in the area as well. We do ship meat. um, So if basically a FedEx can get your house in one day, I can ship meat to you. So pretty much the Minnesota area, some, um, you know, of the Eastern Iowa or Eastern Wisconsin, Southern or Northern Iowa and those sorts of things, Um, because we really want to keep this local um, and just support our, you know, our local immediate community here. Awesome. Thank you. We'll link all that up Mm -hmm. in the show notes. And as we wrap up this conversation, Sarah, um, one question that we ask all of our guests is what does the art of living well mean to you? So to me, this has um, been an ongoing topic for about the last 10 years, as I've really researched what it means to be healthy. Um, I've had to learn and unlearn a lot of things. And to me, living well, it's very multifactorial. So number, I always think of the foods we're eating. So things we're ingesting, um, we obviously want to make sure we're making good choices there for overall wellness, the things we're putting on our skin, what we're washing our hair with, what we're brushing our teeth with, um, what type of meditation are we doing or, you know, daily exercise or, um, what things you're doing for joy. So it's just this big puzzle of being, being well. Um, so how can you, how can you kind of incorporate all of those pieces to live your best life? So the biggest part of what I'm doing here is obviously producing good food, which is going to be the foundation of, of wellness. Um, and then all those other things come into play as well. So it's a, um, a deep topic and there's a lot of information to ingest at one time, but I think just baby steps, people can take baby steps to, um, to just overall wellness. It's going to be, you're never going to regret that. Mm. Absolutely. Oh, we couldn't agree mm-hmm. more. And I love that just the baby steps to overall wellness. Cause we always say, you know, health is a journey, not a destination. Yes. And it's, it is multifaceted. Yes. Like you said, there isn't one silver bullet or one thing. And it's just like taking on one new thing at a time. Yep. So. Yep. And Absolutely. everything little thing that you do does add up and make a difference. Yes. So there yes. is that ripple effect. And I think a lot of people think, Oh, I can't do all that, that you just do that one little thing. And yes. And then maybe in a little while you do the next thing. I tell people, you know what, follow the 80, 20 rule. Your body can truly handle so much. Um, and nobody's going to be perfect, especially in this day and age. I'm finding, I struggle with my kids being a little bit older now and being in school. And like my middle daughter had an, um, what is it? A caramel apple sucker for a birthday treat. It was like, Oh, a dagger to my heart. But I'm like, you know what? You're not going to be able Mm -hmm. to protect them from those things. Um, my goal is just to build a good foundation so that when they're adults, they can make good choices. Um, and yeah, I, I just don't want to expose them to all that, all that stuff and think it's okay. But once in a while, it's okay. My mama's got, my mama heart has to let that go. You know, that's something <laughs> Ernie and I talk about and struggle with all the time. But I think to your point, yeah. build a good foundation and yeah. they're going to have their own journey and their own path. And hopefully with that foundation and the support that you have, they're going to end up, you know, on the right path. When they That's and they're going to have yep. the knowledge. 
Yes. And the knowledge, they're going to know, like you will have taught them so much. And, you know, elementary school and junior high and high school, like that's hard. And they are going to get exposed to pizza mm-hmm. and cakes yes. and processed foods and all kinds of stuff. And they're going to notice how they feel when they eat that stuff too. And mm-hmm. that's, the, the, if you're teaching them how to tune into themselves, it, it will work itself out. Yes. It's so funny you say that. My my youngest went to kindergarten this year and they get milk break, right? He goes, he comes home, he goes, mom, you would not believe how disgusting that milk is. The, <laughs> the pink one, the pink one tastes horrible. I'm assuming that's the skim milk. He said the yellow yeah. one is a little bit better, but I didn't even drink it. It was so bad. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. That, that's right. so yeah. funny. But it's that's like, no. yes, yes. So you've yeah. already taught their body what real food is. And yes. so they, you know, yes. yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. Well, yeah. great advice you have yeah. for all the parents out there too. Cause I know sometimes it gets that's to be a little cool. stressful thinking you're trying to make it all perfect and it, there's no such thing as yeah. perfection. So nope. I love that. And, and, and also just great job. Like Stephanie and I had another guest on, I think she calls herself like the healthy deviant. And like you said, you don't care what other people think. Like that's so important because mm. we are outliers here trying to be healthy and not eat all this processed food and living a certain way. And, um, I think it can be hard and isolating at times. So mm-hmm. kudos mm-hmm. to you. We all have to stick together. Right. <laughs> oh, I, Marnie, I love that. What you just said. It's so true. Yeah. Our community is growing by leaps and bounds. So I thank you too, for the work that you're doing. I get so many moms that reach out to me and they're like, I had no idea about X, YZ and like all these things. And now like once you start that rabbit hole, there is no turning back. You cannot unknow those things. Um, and you're only gonna, you're only gonna do better and you're only gonna help educate more people. And this movement is gonna keep growing. There's no doubt in my mind. Once, I once you know that too. truth. Yeah. So thank you for what you do. Um, these topics are so important. Yeah. Well, thank you for coming on our show today. We love to yeah, have you. Yeah, thank you so much. And we'll, we look yeah, forward to coming out it. visiting your farm next summer. Yes, please do. Okay. Have a okay, great day. Take care. Yeah, okay. bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you so much for listening to the Art of Living Well podcast. We are so grateful that you joined us today. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with a friend or anyone else you think may benefit from this information. We'd love for you to subscribe to our podcast, leave us a review, and tag the Art of Living Well podcast on social media. If you want more inspiration in between episodes, you can find us on social media at the Art of Living underscore well on Instagram and Facebook, where we will share snippets from our daily lives and our journey to living well.